Welcome and thanks for joining today's webinar, Cloud Assurance with CSA Tools. Next slide, please. Today's session is co-hosted by Naspo Value Point and the Cloud uh, BC. Today, Jim Rivas will be joining us presenting uh, on Cloud Security Alliance, uh, presenting for the Cloud Security Alliance. Jim is a co-founder and chief executive officer for the Cloud Security Alliance. He's worked in information security industry as an entrepreneur, writer, speaker, technologist, and business strategist. Jim's innovative thinking about emerging security trends have been published and presented widely throughout the industry. Jim's also the president of the Revis Consulting Group, where he advises security companies, governments, large enterprises, and other organizations on the implication of new trends such as cloud, mobility, and Internet of Things and how to take advantage of them. Jim founded Security Portal, that's the Internet's largest website devoted to information security in 1998 and guided it successfully until his exit in 2000. Jim's widely quoted in the press and has worked with hundreds of corporations on their information security strategies and technology roadmaps. Jim's background is in networking technologies, marketing, and strategy and technology roadmaps. Uh, Jim's received his Bachelor of Administration degree in Computer Science with uh, Western Washington University in 1987. And he's been recognized as the Western Washington Distinguished Alumni in 2015. 2016, Jim was inducted in the Information Security Association's Hall of Fame. And Jim has been named as one of the top 10 cloud computing leaders by SearchCloudComputing.com. We'll hear more from Jim in just a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. So my name is Dugan Petty. I'm an education and outreach coordinator with the National Association of State Procurement Officers, Value Point. Value Point is a cooperative purchasing organization dedicated to getting the services and commodities that state and local governments need to be successful. Uh, NASPO is our parent organization, and it is uh, intended to provide uh, support and, uh, and resources to state chief procurement officers in their work. Also with us today is my colleague and good friend from Cloud BC, Julian Weick. Thanks, Dugan. Hi, it's Julian White from Cloud BC. Um, yeah, Cloud BC it's, is a, a collaborative initiative of some of the largest public sector organizations in British Columbia, Canada, um, set up to support the successful adoption of uh, cloud services in the BC public sector. Um, cloud BC really has two, two primary functions. One, it negotiates, negotiates master agreements with cloud providers on behalf of its customer organizations. And the second primary function is we facilitate knowledge sharing on uh, best practice frameworks and lessons learned to help customers uh, get ready to adopt uh, cloud successfully. And I think to that end, today's webinar with uh, with Jim, the CSA, is a great example of that that second fu function in action. And uh, we're really pleased to uh, uh, co-present this with uh, with with NASPO and 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 to have Jim um, present this uh, the, uh, this this webinar today. So thanks very much, Dugan and Jim. Thanks, Julian. Uh, next slide, please. So Cloud BC and NASPO Value Point have actually been collaborating since 2015 on, uh, on this notion of, of cloud procurement. And as we've uh, done separate procurement contracts uh, for both uh, the region, British Columbia, and, uh, and on the NASPO Value Point side for state and local governments in the United States, We've used a common approach where we've based the security re requirements uh, largely on uh, the, the fine work that the Cloud Security Alliance has done with their cloud control matrix. And we built into both of our contracting processes a due diligence uh, role uh, for uh, governments before they onboard a contractor to allow them to determine whether the cloud security, the cloud security provider, the cloud service provider, uh, actually meets their cloud uh, requirements for data and cloud security. And so 
we, we had uh, previously uh, done a webinar in July of last year uh, where we uh, kind of gave an overview of both contracting approaches and uh, kind of a high-level view of the tools available from Cloud Security Alliance. Today we want to take a deeper dive into these cloud frameworks and Jim is going to, uh, to take some time uh, and go through them and then answer questions along the way. So before I turn it over to Jim, just a couple of housekeeping, uh, housekeeping items. Uh, first off, uh, we have uh, muted uh, your line. So uh, if you uh, have a question, uh, we, we certainly want you to ask them. If you'll hit the question tab, and it'll open it up, and you can uh, type in your question and submit that. We'll be collecting those questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to ask the question uh, at any time. Uh, as Jim concludes, uh, we've built in uh, an amount of time available to answer as many questions as we can get to. I would ask you to direct your questions uh, to Jim on the Cloud Security Alliance uh, uh, areas uh, first and foremost. If you have questions about the contracts, uh, either through uh, Cloud BC or NASPO Value Point, uh, feel free to ask uh, either Julian or myself about those. Uh, later on, our, our addresses are at the end of this presentation, so you can email them to us. Uh, if for some reason we don't get to all the questions a day, then we'll, we'll capture them and we will respond back to you. And finally, uh, we're making a recording of today's session, uh, so the slides and the recording will be available to you. Uh, Julian and I will be following up uh, with, with uh, you uh, to let you know how you can access those slides uh, should you want to. Uh, look at them for future reference or share them with others. So with that, I think that covers all the housekeeping and the introductory uh, remarks. So with that, uh, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Dugan and uh, Julian. And it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you all for joining in. So I, I am going to do somewhat of an overview of the organization, uh, some of these tools, which primarily you're going to find this is free. Uh, research that we're making available to the industry and and uh, talk through uh, a little bit of a drill down in one of the, the most popular tools, the Cloud Controls Matrix, and again be available for answering any questions that uh, you might have. So I, I think we sort of already went over this, what we're going to do, but it's going to be uh, me talking about our organization, some of these key tools, how to use them, and try to make as much time available as we can for um, questions. So just uh, a little bit about the Cloud Security Alliance. So we are a global uh, not-for-profit organization. We are, are focused on research. Research and education is the core of what we do. So we uh, are doing a lot of very interesting futures-oriented research on information security like artificial intelligence, blockchain, other things. but. The, the core of what we're doing and what I'm talking about today are sort of practical best practices and tools for adopting cloud securely. Uh, we have a provider certification, which I'll talk a little bit about in my slide called the STAR program. We, we also have a user certification that's pretty highly regarded. I, I won't be talking about it, but you may want to look into that. And uh, we are an organization that because we, we started uh, I think at the right time, I think we are considered to be the industry leader and sort of a, a unique one of a kind in terms of what we do. So we were, were founded in 2009. Uh, we have our, our global headquarters in the uh, Seattle, uh, Bellingham, uh, Washington area, Asia Pacific headquarters in Singapore. Uh, we uh, have uh, sort of a virtual presence because uh, we're in several countries in Europe. Uh, but we, we have people and we have chapters really all over the world, and, and so there's a lot of opportunities for you to, to meet up online or in person with uh, other people who are involved in our organization. And we have a lot of research just continually going uh, on, so a, a, a lot of interesting things, I think, for you to be able to go um, take a look at. And, and the slide where Dugan was saying the, the slides are going to be available to you, there's, there's a lot of links in this that describe where to go get and download a lot of the material for further reading. So 
no need to bother sort of trying to do screen captures of your screen, but uh, there's, there's, it's, it's very dense with a lot of uh, information. So just to start off a little bit on, you, you probably all had different sorts of definitions and, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but it's, it's good to sort of level set on cloud computing and, and, and for me, I like to talk about it to really help people understand why it's so significant. So there, there's been an expression that uh, someone said that I think it was Mark Andreessen that software is eating the world and, and, and cloud appears to be eating all of uh, business computing. So it really started out as a pretty simple idea that instead of buying computers, take, let's, let's actually just provision services on a shared set of computers. And that essentially means taking something from being um, physical devices and, and organizing it like a utility. And you know, way, way back uh, 120 years ago, all big manufacturing organizations had someone known as the, the vice president of electricity because we didn't have a power grid and so it was necessary for every company to figure out how to generate their own electricity to run their, their manufacturing capabilities, whatever they might be. And it's sort of the same thing when you really think about it. Cloud is really taking that IT where everyone sort of does their own, builds their own IT, and provides this utility that people at, at this point just use it to start building business applications. And so while that's a really simple I, idea, and doesn't seem like that would be necessarily super profound. It's actually, uh, to us, it's created a lot of innovation, a lot of disruption of organizations, a lot of very interesting and cool things where people have an idea of something they want to do, and typically it's going to require them uh, to buy a lot of computers, take six months, spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, and, and they're finding ways to do some of those tasks by just uh, spending a few hours on a, a, a cloud provider's uh, system. So, so we feel that it's so compelling and just in our spot checks of the Global 2000 where when we started in 2009 they said this was ridiculous to maybe three years ago they said we'll use some of this to it doesn't matter the, the type of industry, organization, government, finance, retail, transportation, they all are telling me over the past year that we're all in, we're, we're planning to shut down, decommission all our data centers, and not only are we going cloud, but we're gonna actually probably go pretty aggressively into public cloud. So when you look at it from a developer perspective, uh, the people who, who write the applications, they find cloud to be such a compelling, uh, rich environment that they're sort of making the decision for you and, and in the future, an application that you like, there's not going to be a shrink wrap license version of it. It's going to be a cloud only version. So, so we're, we're seeing that, that charge. So I, I recognize this that block diagram is a little bit of an eye chart there. We, we have research on our site where you can expand that. But the idea that we want to portray is, is when we started in 2009, we created this sort of layered model that said that software as a service, this full business application, that represents layers on top of platform as a service and on top of infrastructure as a service. And infrastructure as a service is just this basic compute and storage. And the, the importance of, of explaining this is that there actually can be several different companies or even a company that occupies each layer here. And the business application that you get can be a mashup of a lot of different services and companies. And that becomes pretty important when you are dealing with the assurance and due diligence and all those sorts of issues. So um, it's important to sort of understand that. And when we, have, uh, when we started this, any company that you might think of as a software as a service company eight to 10 years ago, they generally speaking, uh, they owned all of the infrastructure, all the way through the data center, the, the power supplies, everything. And that's really changed. And the next slide sort of depicts how we sort of see this, where software as a service is 
the largest, most diverse area. It's, it's the largest area you're going to need to deal with in terms of, of the, the organizations and the services that you need to vet and approve and, and look at the risks. Software as a service is that full business application, which now, instead of primarily being something that had its own data centers, it's primarily a service that resides in larger cloud infrastructure providers. And you know we know the the, the name brand names of the uh, the very largest ones like Amazon, AWS, Microsoft, uh, Azure, Google Cloud. Uh, there's there's definitely more than that, and there's definitely uh, a lot that are going on some sort of managed um, private clouds as well. But it's it's uh, we're we're seeing that as being the sort of largest trend in that the software as a service is really independent. Uh, of the infrastructure layer, and you're seeing that as being something that is uh, um, really decoupled from that. And, and so it creates some, as I'll get into, it creates some uh, pretty unique uh, so, sort of uh, challenges, opportunities in terms of how we do that appropriate vetting, risk assessment, and assurance. So when we think about what a lot of these issues are and challenges to, to where the future of, of cloud assurance goes, um, the, the issue of globalization is certainly a big one. We, we spend a lot of time, and the best practices I'll talk about, we've, we've given them or had them adopted by countries and industries all over the world. But uh, there's, there's often some changes and tweaks, and, and every country wants to, to a degree, Create a lot of their own rules and regulations, and so the global compute utility. But yet we have a lot of localized uh, regulatory requirements. So that creates a, a real need to create some harmony and to to figure out how we can normalize what are the the appropriate control objectives. Because it's really hard for if you think of it from a cloud provider perspective to say, hey, I've got to be compliant with every single different. Um, country, industry out there, plus the, each of my customers, customers might want to bring me unique requirements. So that's a real challenge. So uh, the, the idea of uh, this agility and speed is uh, a, a real issue in terms of the, the vetting. And, and gone are the days when you had months and months to be able to do a risk assessment to vet and approve a, a new application. We, we see it happening in days and hours now. Um, so the, one, of, one of the big things that you will see in, in cloud, and, and there's a term DevOps, which uh, is, is really describing some of this very uh, aggressive and, and fast-changing nature of software now, is you can think back to the days when, oh, there's a new version of Windows, a new version of SAP or whatever, and you know, we're going to upgrade. Uh, once a year, every other year, maybe twice a year. Well, now the major cloud applications that are used are, are generally speaking, the software is updated several times a day. New new code is introduced every day. And so it, it creates this real need for us to be thinking about this, this point in time audit assurance uh, the paradigm that we have. How do we sort of address how we deal with risks and assurance on a more continuous basis because of all this change. Um, the, the scoping of assurance and audit, and this is something I'll talk about in more detail, this changes quite a bit in this environment, that inverted pyramid I described where you have a, a lot of SaaS providers maybe using some shared infrastructure that how do we think in terms of scoping that appropriately so we can get to the core issues and how do we think in terms of these providers inheriting underlying uh, controls. And so uh, there, there's, we expect there's going to be in, in your profession and in, in what you're doing in terms of this type of vetting, we, we expect you're going to see a lot of changes in the next few years. And that's why we're, we're spending a lot of time on blockchain and autonomics and AI and other things, which that'll, that'll be a future presentation. But uh, it's, it's important to, to understand kind of where things are and, and the state of art of the state of practice. So uh, a, a little bit about the specific uh, considerations that we've identified and we think about. It's, it's 
if you understand you know, risk management and you understand you know, confidentiality, integrity, availability of information, a lot of principles, it's not as though they change, but definitely the nature of cloud means certain areas uh, become more, uh, more apparent, more relevant, and are, are magnified. And primarily when we think about this, it's, it's moving to this software-defined world, and it's looking at how do we mitigate risk? How do we uh, look at software-based or virtual controls as a way to replace or at least augment the physical controls that are out there? So we have a report that we issue every other year, and, and we'll do some spot checking on it um, more frequently than that uh, about uh, what we see the key threats are. And so you can go, it's, a, it's a, not a bad read, you can go uh, download this. It's uh, it's about 20 pages or so, but uh, this is uh, what the the latest report of uh, the the top 12 threats that uh, we have as as areas of concern, and you know, data breaches are are probably more number one because of the impact versus the the frequency of those today. But uh, if you look at Number two, number three, the compromised credentials, the um, insecure APIs, meaning developers developing things very rapidly. Those are probably the top means by which you can expect to see attacks and risks and breaches in, in cloud or lots of availability. It's going to be primarily through these areas. The, the, um, the user, the cloud tenant, is the, uh, the weak point as we see it, and people trying to customize and, and very rapidly build out new applications on clouds. Those are the areas where you expect to see the, um, the, the threats and the risks. And so and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we think about in terms of uh, how you mitigate in those areas. So, you know, how, how do we encourage you to think about it? So, um, definitely. From a consumer perspective, we, we, it's, it's important to know your readiness. It's, it's important to know, um, you know what's the risk appetite for any specific type of application, you know, un understand what data you're putting in the cloud. We, we find that it's very important that you have a very sound strategy for identity management, uh, for um, strong authentication, those sorts of things. And, you know, we're, we're Definitely not saying, and and I think there's there's still some perception that cloud is a greater risk than uh, traditional internal IT. That's definitely not the case. Um, in in a lot of cases, uh, cloud is the more secure option. But it's important that you understand because of this diversity of there's a lot of different types of clouds, a lot of different cloud providers, and understanding what you, how that matches up to your business application. We do find that the information security and assurance people that are most successful, they have more of a gentle policing policy where they, they gain insight into how an organization is trying to use cloud, planning to use cloud, and uh, try to see if they can redirect them to a, a appropriately secured option there. So for anything you want to do in cloud, there's a way to do it securely or insecurely, and there's different cloud vendors that will help you along either of those paths. So it's really important to look at how you can direct them to ones that, that have a really easy ability to do the appropriate encryption or the appropriate strong authentication, those sorts of things. And the, the, the little graphic here, what's that that is trying to help you understand is, is you know, understand the differences between infrastructure as a service, which is the, the basic compute, basic storage, and the full business application software as a service. And, and if you're talking about using infrastructure and you're putting your own applications out there, it's primarily the, the tenant, the, the cloud customer's responsibility to implement all of the technical security controls. The, the cloud provider will only go up to a, a certain level of the physical infrastructure and they want to give you a very flexible development environment. By contrast, for software as a service, it ends up being primarily the cloud provider's responsibility to implement the technical controls 
and it's the tenant's responsibility to look at more of the uh, security from a perspective of procurement, the due diligence, the audit, and that's kind of, I think, core to, to what we're talking about here. There are some things, additional technical controls that uh, that a tenant can do even on software as a service that might relate to federating identity or some, some other types of technical uh, capabilities. But primarily, it's your job to have more of an assurance role there. So important to understand those uh, types of differences. So now I'm going to go into uh, hopefully what's about the heart of it and, and the area that uh, you're waiting for is to talk a little bit more about the tools that we have for this. So we we have a, uh, a few different products, research artifacts, and, and primarily cloud controls matrix is going to be the heart of what I talk about. And it really it really drives the other three areas: the the star program, our star registry, the consensus assessments initiative questionnaire, and then our star watch um, SaaS application. So Serval is based on cloud controls matrix as a foundation, and this is having the links for all the different places that you can go uh, to our site and download these uh, different um, programs, d download more information about them, all those sorts of things. So let's get into the cloud controls matrix and let's let's go talk about what this is. So what, the, what this is, is we define what we call this meta framework. It's a security framework be designed for understanding cloud computing and that that supply chain that what I talked about this this mashups that that uh, layered model of several different organizations potentially in there and the, it's intended to really help you understand what are the the security controls important in cloud who should be doing it is it the cloud provider is it the customer is it both um, what's the applicability for the different type of cloud service. And what we do is we have mapped this to a lot of, uh, I don't know how, how many of the total is, that's uh, definitely growing quite a bit, but we map it to a lot of different global regulations or a country specific regulations. We often have the case where a, a lot of uh, different countries or groups will will give us a mapping that they've done. So, and then we'll go do some quality assurance on it. So at a high level, that's what it is. So the cloud controls matrix, when we say controls, and you will we'll dive into this a little bit more, I, I actually think it's m more of what I would describe as control objectives. There's, uh, uh, there's not, I think, in our industry, a clear enough delineation where uh, there's a, a control objective might be to have a secure password and a secure password standard, for example. And then there can be very specific controls that say it needs to be exactly this many characters long. It needs to comprise of these special characters. That's that's what I would consider to be a, a specific security control uh, that would support a broader control objective. So when we say controls, you might want to think of it more as control objectives. We've, we've organized it into these 16 different domains. And as I said, we've mapped it into just a lot of different. So to go uh, dive into this a little bit more, as, as you'll see, as you, the, the standard delivery model is a, a very large spreadsheet. And it's, it's great if you've got one of those giant printers or a, a wide screen uh, to be able to look at it. Uh, there's, there's certainly a lot you can do to ma manipulate it, but um, there's a lot of different uh, columns and I'll go through and talk, talk through these that basically organize it to those different domains and provide them IDs and, and describe a lot of these uh, different areas that uh, I've, I've been foreshadowing. So when you look at the control domain, this, this again, this is a, a um, it's a, um, usually abbreviated in three letters, but it's uh, uh, basically one of those 16 domains. And then within each domain, there's uh, several um, controls. I don't think there's any domain that has only one control, but out of those 133, um, they are split and uh, across those 16 different domains. So 
the um, specification, this control specification, that's uh, some text that you'll find. And that's where I really call this, this control objective that talks about you know, what, what it is. And I'm going to go through, we'll, we'll go through just real quickly all 16 of the domains. So um, we talk about the architectural relevance as well so that you can understand, you know, hey, is this something that is existing on the physical level? Is it something that's really more on the application layer, the data layer? And that's really helpful because if you understand the type of cloud service that it is, you can sort of narrow down, well, who might be responsible for this? If this is a software application that uh, um, is not going to have any direct connection to the physical infrastructure, maybe we've got to figure out, maybe it's not a, a specific person with that SaaS provider, maybe it's understanding who's running the data center to look at the physical issues there. So. Architectural relevance ends up being um, pretty helpful. So what I wanted to uh, go through next is to um, talk about the, uh, the um, different delivery models. And the um, I'd honestly, I'll tell you that the delivery models are not as useful. And I would probably, uh, um, we'll, I think we'll, we will improve this in future versions but you tend to find that almost everything is considered relevant to um, all of these different um, SaaS platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. And to, to me, I think it's part of this legacy that there has been historically a lot of SaaS providers that owned all the physical infrastructure in the data centers. So I, I would encourage you to look more at the architectural relevance as being um, something that's more useful. The supplier relationship, that area uh, to me is, is very useful. It uh, does look at something that is more of a service provider versus a, a tenant um, responsibility for that control objective. And some of them are both as, as um, you can see in that little screenshot there. So um, that ends up being pretty useful. And then the scope applicability, this is uh, really where we start talking about all of the different uh, mappings that are out there and you know, how does it relate to maybe other requirements that, uh, that you have out there. So and we'll get into a little bit of that here in a few minutes. So first domain, application and interface security. So you know, this ends up being uh, something that's uh, you know, definitely um, pretty broadly applicable, and this sort of relates to that, the, the areas I was talking about of, um, you know, agile development and, you know, one of our, our top threats of being a API security in that you see so much, um, you know, applications being mashed up and developed very rapidly in cloud. So this, this area of uh, controls and we've got the four controls listed there to deal with, you know, how do you make sure that you have, that you're like, you're, you're doing code review or you're scanning the application for security and how you're making sure that you are um, protecting the, the data properly. So it ends up being a, a pretty important area. Audit assurance compliance on it, obviously. This uh, talks a lot about, hey, you know, what's, what, what should you be asking of the providers? Should you be asking them for their, their SOC 2 or an ISO 27001 certificate or FedRAMP or something else? And, and how do you uh, think about a, a framework for your own organization? How do you map all your, your requirements uh, to the different cloud requirements? And you know, some people end up using our cloud controls matrix for all of that, but it may be lacking like some specific organizational requirements and that may require that you do your own sort of custom mapping within it. So it's an important domain. Um, the, the business continuity management, the operational resilience, this, this does end up being a lot more relevant to the infrastructure as a service. Uh, a, a lot of it's physical, physically related, but actually there's, uh, there's some things that are very important in here from a software as a service perspective. So when you do hear from time to time, for example, a major cloud provider has an outage and people are down. And you know, often 
that's that you could blame the cloud provider, but often it's a it's a failure also of the customer not using multiple availability zones. Hey, it's an important application. Let's use East Coast, West Coast. Let's use European availability zones. Let's let's make our application redundant and resilient. And so there are a few different areas inside of the business continuity management and operational resilience, which also apply to software as a service. Uh, but certainly, uh, you have to make sure if it's your, you're focused on the software that somehow these we're, we're getting some insight and visibility into these lower layers, the, the hardware, the power, um, to make sure that we're, we're covering all those different areas as well. So change control, configuration management, and, and testing, quality assurance. Uh, uh, it's also important to look at this because, as I was mentioning before, just the, the rapidity and the, uh, the amount of change that happens in these different areas, this will help you sort of cope with some of the, the best practices and recommendations that are relevant to this fast-moving, agile sort of development. DevOps development environment. So pretty important area. The, uh, the, the data security information lifecycle management, this is uh, something that it's, it's really, we focus on this from a, a data security perspective, obviously, and we've got a six phase life cycle there, create, store, use, share, archive, destroy. We do find that that in a lot of cases you find that cloud providers are, are very, very good at preserving, protecting, keeping information available. It might be harder for them to actually destroy information. So it's really important to understand the, 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 these different areas. And so we have uh, seven specific controls that relate to this from you know, how, do you, how do you understand the, um, the information, the importance of it, how do you make sure that the provider gives you a way to have information that might be more important um, classified in a, in a different area or, or what do you need to do to be ready for that um, because again these controls can be a customer control that can be provider or in a lot of cases they're both so and data security is, is definitely the areas and that we're we're always very con cognizant of we're always very concerned about and it sort of makes its way through um, some of the other domains as well. So the um, data center security, again, this is something that is uh, in, important definitely for the infrastructure as a service side. And so if, if, it, if you are looking at that type of thing, you'll definitely be concerned about all of these controls. You, you will want to understand how the, the SaaS provider is they're either making some of these mitigating um, lack of visibility in these controls or, or make sure we understand how they've vetted that. So very much similar to the, the, the BCM domain in terms of the um, applicability, when you would use it, when you wouldn't. And, and the lower you go down in the cloud stack, the more likely you are going to need to uh, use this. So encryption and key management, as I said, you know, data security is so important, and, and um, encryption is really what you find at the end of the day. It's the most resilient security control to protect information when all other security controls are are breached in some way or another. And so it's it's definitely areas that we we think about a lot. The, it ends up being the key management uh, is, is probably the harder part of this. Encrypting information itself is fairly straightforward, and we've got you know, very robust uh, crypto algorithms that are out there. But managing keys in a way that the right people have access or that you are able to share access with a group of people, that's still a bit of the more, more challenging areas that we, we see. So, in, in any case, we we provide here sort of the state of the art types of uh, controls related to these uh, areas. So governance, risk management, these are again I think sort of table stakes, and 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 again this is this relates very much to, to not only 
the uh, provider and, and what sort of governance they have, but what do you have as a tenant and what, what are your standards for risk assessment, what sorts of uh, data classification programs do you use, what sorts, what's your compliance program, what is your overall information security management system look like. And, you know, we're inspired by a lot of the, we try not to reinvent the wheel, and we're inspired by a lot of the things that have been out there for, for many years. And from a governance perspective, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, prior art that are very relevant. The challenge ends up being in this very virtual mo world, things are moving fast. Uh, it can be very hard to sort of see where one company's responsibilities and another's pick up. And the, this fast-moving nature of cloud means that you, you may instantiate business relationships for a very short amount of time, you know, hours, minutes, seconds even. So that creates some more issues. So, so hopefully we've got some useful guidance in, in here related to that. So human resources, and you know, this is, I think, sort of uh, table stakes here. and. Uh, a lot of important areas, and, and you find as cloud systems get larger and larger, and these software systems are have more and more users on them, that these ideas of, of you know, vetting people, but also making sure that we've got um, separation of duties appropriately, uh, that that becomes you know, even more important that we've got the appropriate roles and responsibilities. So. Uh, human resources is, is a, a key area. It's, it's, again, one of those areas. Probably we'll see that rise even higher in our, our top threat uh, metric over the years to go because as, as we, we know that the cloud tenants, the users, are sort of a weak link now, but will, will that also be something that we'll see in the cloud providers themselves as are, are they going to be more of a target themselves? So, uh, so Definitely some in, an important area that we think you need to be looking at. So I, I, identity and access management, and, and again, that was that top threat number two that we've seen uh, that really it's, it's in, in terms of the means to cause mischief now and cause a breach, it's really number one. And so this is just a very important area. And, and again, this is one that is absolutely shared in that the cloud users need to have a very strong identity management strategy because any organization is not going to use a single cloud provider. They're going to use lots of cloud providers. We, a lot of the Global 2000 we work with, they, they have about a thousand different unique cloud applications or more. And so it's very important that they have consistent management of those consistent policy enforcement and having a very strong identity management strategy to be able to federate and, and to use secured credentials across a lot of different cloud providers requires the, the customer, the cloud tenant, to have a good strategy. And it also requires the cloud provider to be compatible with that strategy. So there's, there's a lot here to dig into. And, and it's obviously it's a, it's a key area. It's a very important area that we, we think you have to understand and, and look into. So uh, next domain, infrastructure and virtualization security. So when we talk about infrastructure as a service, you could almost think of the um, virtual machine as the, the Lego, if you will, that, that building block, that atomic unit of, of um, cloud infrastructure. And so we spend a lot of time on this, on what the issues are and the key controls that you need to be understanding and you know it ends up being very different from you know traditional data centers traditional IT systems we we actually spent a lot of time on resiliency and the importance of you know maintaining a a server that was online and had an uptime maybe of years and and we certainly want to keep it updated but with virtual machines, it's, it's a very different IT model where they are maybe instantiated to do a, a task for minutes and then it's decommissioned and it, it's torn down and it disappears. And that, that creates good and bad insecurity. 
it creates some very good things in terms of you don't have sort of this entropy that happens and it becomes sort of this fixed target because it's always coming up, going down. But then tracking that, managing that um, can also, if not done properly, create some other um, security risks. So we try to talk through a lot of this. And, and there's also concerns that, hey, by using the virtual machine, are, are there, for example, maybe other companies that exist uh, within the same hardware managed by the same hypervisor and they're in different virtual machines and so it's sort of like that neighbor and and is my neighbor doing things that are going to create any security issues for me um, some you know, close, close by neighbor so so there's a lot here to be thinking about and this is a real uh, really important area and it does relate um, primarily towards the infrastructure uh, as a service, although it can be used for some of the areas, other areas as well. So interoperability and portability is another domain which is really, it's, it's something that's important to vet with just the, the diversity and the fast moving nature of, of cloud computing. What we've observed is that we, we still, and we, we don't have as complete of standards as we would like, and that is, for many cloud providers, it's kind of by design that they want to create this walled garden environment for say, their customers, provide some extra value add, but not necessarily make it really easy to switch from that provider. And that can be okay if you just need to go in understanding that, understanding what are the, for example, what are the extensions, what are the proprietary portions of that provider we're using versus the standard portions we're using. And so it becomes a very important way to understand, you know, the, the um, ability to make our systems um, highly available, redundant, um, the ability to negotiate with that provider for a better, um, better price over time. Um, a, a lot of issues come into that. So it's, it's, it's an important area. Mobile security. This is, uh, um, we, we get debates on, on whether it's, uh, it was something we should have included or not, but uh, it was something we um, opted to for uh, several reasons, and um, some of the main ones are that uh, in in some cases for cloud services, the, the cloud providers we talk to use mobile quite a bit for the actual management of their cloud services, and for customers, it's, it's increasingly becoming the, uh, the the main means by which they use cloud services. So we're, we're not trying to cover all aspects of mobile security, but we're trying to, in this domain, sort of create this Venn diagram of where does mobile, mobility become very relevant in access and usage and being provisioned by the cloud and having your data stored in cloud. So that's the purpose of this domain. So uh, security incident management, e-discovery, forensics, uh, it's, it's, again, you know, these are all very familiar sorts of topics, but you know, what, what are the things that we need to be doing, be aware of? And in, in a lot of cases, the forensics aspects of cloud may require specific um, agreements or even specific services you need to procure related to forensics or e-discovery from the provider and, and you, you you don't get it um, when the when the crisis happens so a lot of times you have to be real proactive about it in some cases it's something you can you can do on your own and for example having a problem uh, potential breach and being able to take an image snapshot of a virtual machine and then just restarting that uh, application from a fresh image and then sort of offline being able to do the analysis it ends up being different from um, traditional um, forensics and incident response. There are also some, some sticky issues here because from a cloud provider perspective, they often see uh, because of the shared nature of what they're doing, it can be a challenge to provide individual customers with as complete of information that they need without breaching some other uh, service level agreement they have with a different customer. So it's, it's getting definitely much better. It's, 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 it's a world better from when we started CSA, but it's definitely some important areas to be thinking about and understanding. So supply chain management, and, and you know, I think this is, it's, it's pretty 
both for the hardware, the components, as well from a software basis, this really ends up being a supply chain, um, just a, a different sort of a supply chain. So we have a lot of controls in that area. Threats in uh, vulnerability management, and uh, this ends up being you know, a very, very important to the, the sort of the staff moving, constantly changing nature. So we've tried to reflect that in the security controls here. So those are the 16 domains of Cloud Controls Matrix. Now I'm going to just um, quickly sort of go through how we how we um, have used this and incorporated this into some other tools. But the Cloud Controls Matrix itself, you can download it, you can use it as is um, for your your ability to do that management and measurement, and a lot of auditors and assessors just use it from a standalone basis. But what we try to do with the Consensus Assessment Initiative Questionnaire is actually uh, create something that we thought made it a little bit more usable. Essentially what we did is we added a bunch of questions that relate and, and map directly to each of the control objectives to help you better understand if that control objective is being met. So, um, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's 290 questions, so it's a, it's, it tends to be a many to one one control tends to have many questions, or at least uh, more than one in, in most cases. So um, the, uh, um, the CAIQ, it's used a lot by the cloud service providers to do their own self-assessment. It's really used by, it's by, used by auditors quite a bit as a tool for them to help calculate and understand how um, people rate on this CTM. Just you, I, can, I think imagine most of the use cases. So uh, I'm not going to um, go into a lot of this. It's uh, something that you know we find it's becoming fairly standard. And um, this CAIQ, most cloud providers have um, seen it and used it. And chances are, if you ask a cloud provider to provide their CAIQ, they can give it to you. Uh, you know, that day usually. So it looks pretty similar um, and to the uh, um, CCM. What we've added are um, essentially some, uh, some questions where we've extended the, the naming convention of the CCM to create related questions that map specifically to those. And in, in all cases, I think there's one oddball question. In all cases, yes is considered to be a good answer. So here you can you can see uh, an example. So there's there's one control specification for the CCM, and there's with this specific one in the business continuity management area. There's um, and it's the BCR 07 specifically that control specification. There's five different questions you can see that are specific to that. And by answering those questions, hopefully that helps give a more complete picture of uh, um, whether or not that control specification is being met. So uh, sample um, of, of this. So you know, we'll see people that will uh, they'll, they'll go send this to them. They'll, you'll, you'll see that yes, no, not applicable um, area. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more than not applicable um, where we see that as being most relevant. And um, an additional uh, part of this is you'll see the notes area. So uh, what you'll find is that a lot of cloud providers, they want to explain their answer, particularly if they say no or not applicable. Um, but even for yes, you'll see, and, and they'll vary widely. You'll see some that are very verbose and you, there, there are a few where they, they don't even um, fill out the notes. It's definitely not required from our perspective, but um, it does make it richer. Uh, so um, that's, you know, that's essentially what you see for the CAIQ. It's take the CCM, add um, questions, multiple questions for each control, uh, and uh, you know, understand any sort of mitigating notes that they might, that the cloud provider might have in there, or, or notes that you might make after uh, talking to a cloud provider. So the STAR program, this is something that it's, it's based on this, and I'll just talk through this uh, a little bit, but 
it's the it's the most widely it's the largest uh, repository of cloud security what I'd say statements of security um, and I think we're up over um, 30, 300 uh, entries now so there is still some issue with transparency in the industry where we know like several large companies that they have um, just privately like more copies of our um, questionnaire than we have in this public repository. But this is part of the necessity for um, showing transparency. And it's a three-level system of self-assessment, third-party assessment, uh, and then continuous monitoring. So the essentially the level one star assessment is people have already, cloud providers have already filled out the CAIQ um, or they've done a custom version of the cloud controls matrix and they've sent it to us and we've posted it. And so if you're using a, um, a public cloud service, it's a good idea to go here first probably because you'll in a lot of cases find if it's in anywhere, any type of a popular cloud service, it's probably already in there. And the um, level two is something we've worked with major certification bodies. Uh, we had we worked with the British Standards Institution to create something called STAR certification, which essentially it combines the ISO 27001 with the cloud controls matrix, which provides the appropriate sort of scoping, scope of applicability for doing an ISO certification so that you can get a certification that basically gives the best of both worlds. And so, and now we, all major ISO 27001 certification bodies, they offer the CSA STAR certification. Star attestation is a combination of the SOC 2 Type 2 attestation, and we, we co-developed this with the AICPA in the U.S. And so this, again, this is a SOC 2 report, but it uses the cloud controls matrix for the appropriate control scope, and CPAs can provide this. And then we've got a special Jim. version called E-Star um, for the Chinese market. Jim, I might add that, uh, that the Utah team uh, for the NASPO Value Point Award uh, required uh, this uh, certification uh, for responsiveness. So no awards were made uh, if they did not provide this certification, and those are, are posted on the site. And then extra points were given in the evaluation for the Level 2 and the Level 3 um, review. Great, thanks. And, that, and that's, you know, we're, we're really encouraging uh, providers, we spend a lot of time with them to say, hey, you, you know, do, 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 do them all and, and we're going to try to make this as um, broadly used as we can. And it's, it's good to get a third party uh, audit uh, certificate, but it's also good to see the underlying evidence. And so that's why it's nice to also have that, that level one um, questionnaire available and filled out for you. So um, here's an example of uh, how we've taken a real world example and a, a, a customer showed us a, 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 in the financial services industry how they've tried to understand this idea of control inheritance. So Okta is an identity as a service organization and they run in the AWS cloud. And so they occupy some of those top layers and and Amazon provides some of those lower layers. So if you go dig in, you go to our STAR registry and you look at Okta's, uh, their level one, um, CAIQ, you'll find 23 questions that they say not applicable, and then they go talk, they refer you to Amazon. And so we looked and the, the customer looked at the Amazon uh, CAIQ and there, there's entry in our STAR program and they actually did say yes for the things that Okta said not applicable we felt that Amazon had very good answers for those specific answers. Not Just as an example not endorsing any of the, the, the products here but it ended up being I think something that um, was, was actually pretty valuable and it, we need to do better here but this is how you're going to be able to get to a, a point of scoped audits that are more narrowly focused on the important issues by doing control inheritance. And so this, this publicly available, the tools and this, this publicly available registry are, are a big help to that. 
So control errors, and I think these are things I've sort of talked about. We got to eliminate the redundancy. We got to we got to change audit from a data gathering to a data analysis, um, and you know it does require this sort of level of transparency and adherence to the different standards. So Star Watch is so so everything I've talked about the um, the CCM the CAIQ going out to our Star Registry that's all free uh, free tools freely available and obviously if you're a cloud provider and you're going to go get a Star certification audit you're going to spend money to do that but uh, from a consumer uh, perspective consuming the information that's all free this is just something to make you aware of. We have something called Star Watch, where what we've done is we've taken the cloud controls matrix and the CAIQ and we've put them in, into a SaaS application and we've, we've created some, some what you'd say collaboration and groupware functionalities so you can perform an assessment by farming out different questions, uh, different cloud provider tasks to maybe a consultant, different people on your team, maybe the provider themselves to answer different question. So we think this is a useful way to start you know, thinking about this and organizing this uh, information. And it, it is something that uh, we, we do charge for to, uh, to go fund, continue fund the development of this. It's completely uh, optional. And, and there's also, there are some solutions if you're using some, some um, GRC packages that they may have already licensed are our um, IP inside of what they're doing, so you may have access to it in a database format already, but here's just another option for you. So, and there's all the different targets for it, so, which uh, certainly makes sense. So you can go check it out. Um, just not gonna go into too much uh, more about it, but it is uh, something that you can um, go take a look at. So, wanting to make sure that uh, we have time for um, questions uh, and and that you can make sure you get uh, um, everything you want to get out of this uh, session so you know that a customer auditor you know this is these are these are the key things that you should be able to do with uh, with the CCM the cloud controls matrix and its companion cloud assessment there you should be able to do the assessments should be able to uh, you know provide in a in a way that's familiar with them, uh, a way to engage the cloud provider on this. You should have a good, clear way to map this with other standards you're already using and are familiar with. And we're, we're actually um, doing a um, update. There's been a recent update to NIST 800-53. And we're, I think we're one rev behind, but that is something we're, we're actually working with a couple of state governments on. Uh, on that, and so it's uh, something there's, we're, we're always changing, we're always updating that, but it should give you a path from the standards you're familiar with uh, and the CCM to sort of ha have that bridge to help you understand how to do these types of assessments in cloud environments. And you know, be, because of the, the heavy adoption of this and a lot of the reciprocity we're seeing from different governments around the world and different industries, we are creating more of what I'd say it's sort of a normalized view of the underlying security controls should, that should be present in all of these different areas. So that's, that's I know I breezed through a, quite a bit of material there, uh, but uh, that's essentially what I wanted to cover. There's the, um, contact information for how to get a hold of us. Again, we try to make as much information as we can uh, freely available. We do have additional paid training, other sorts of resources that are out there, but the, the, the research artifacts themselves, you can go to our site, you can download them, and uh, there's, there's a world of information there for you. And I, I think a, a lot of people get pretty intimidated or uh, afraid of the risks in cloud, and and we find we have not only the tools I've mentioned, we have about 200 other white papers out there that we don't feel like enough people have um, used those. And, and probably a lot of the issues or concerns you have, they've probably been addressed in, in some of those papers. So we encourage you to go, go use the resources. You can't be free. So with that, I want to thank you very much. And, and I, I think at this point, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dugan and, and see if we've got questions uh, from the audience. 
Well, very good, Jim. Uh, great detail, uh, a lot of information packed into the presentation, and I think really helpful. Uh, so uh, let me just remind the audience that uh, you're free to ask any questions. Uh, just go ahead and open that question tab and write your question in, and, uh, and Jim can respond to that question. I'll pick that question up and, uh, and pass it on to Jim. Um, so one question, uh, Jim, you, you're talking uh, just in the last couple of slides about, um, about kind of mapping to some of the government standards. Uh, you talked about NIST 8053, uh, which is an important standard for uh, state governments. It's fairly recent, and so uh, mapping to that uh, is something that that, I, that a number of us will re resonate with. W one question I have is that um, all the states have requirements, and usually it's not just uh, uh, it's multiple agencies within the states as well uh, to be CJIS compliance, Criminal Justice Information System compliance. Is there a, an overlay or a map to that uh, through the the controls that uh, can help a state do that, or, or do they have to kind of work through that themselves? What what help can you give them? Yeah, so the the CJIS, that's been a, a request that uh, we have received in the past, and we're actually we're we're looking at that. If uh, we we've got to get the right number of um, subject matter experts that can go do that. The the problem we've seen is it has been um, not uniform and so it ends up being one of those um, things that there's not enough of an audience to be able to do sort of a standard type of, of mapping there so we're looking at it and I'd say if there's people out there that are interested in helping us out with that um, we, um, we we may go uh, work on that but we, we have had a, a couple of states that have inquired on that yeah, I know we've got some enterprise architects who are on this, and, the, and that question probably uh, is, is going to come up as states look at uh, cloud solutions and leveraging cloud solutions. How do they how do they engage with the Cloud Security Alliance if they want to uh, become involved in that? Are there work groups that are specifically uh, in, in place, or are there domains that uh, that you are are have that? Um, that a state could join. How, how? What would they do? Yeah. So the the uh, when if it's an issue of how do I relate a requirement I have with the uh, the standards we have with the cloud controls matrix, probably the the best thing I could recommend is that they go to the cloud controls matrix page on our site, and that was a link that was in one of the earlier slides. And you can enroll yourself at self-service. You can enroll yourself in that uh, specific working group and ask some of those questions. So in addition to like the formal mappings we have done, there's definitely a lot of chatter about how do I relate this to some other requirement or some, some other issue. We, we also have an enterprise architecture and uh, we have sort of a separate mapping of that. How do you, how do you map architectures to control requirements. So the best way to engage probably for that level of question would be to go directly into the Cloud Controls Matrix working group and go, go enroll and go ask the question there. There's also uh, ability to contact our research uh, team and that's just research at cloudsecuritylines.org. If you're not sure if, hey, I'm not sure if this question fits into that specific working group or some of the other areas, but if it, if it is about relating it to some uh, some type of strict statutory or standards requirement, then um, Cloud Controls Matrix Working Group is probably your best bet. Okay, that's uh, that's good advice. I think you mentioned you were working with a couple of states. Can you can you talk about uh, some of the things you're you're doing with the uh, with yeah. the state or other governments? Yeah. So um, so so one of the states that we're engaged with, they're they're actually the the largest uh, user, the largest state user of uh, Amazon AWS, and they're also using Azure quite a bit as well. So a real power user, and so they're they're actually pretty sophisticated and advanced in their their ISMS program, and very aggressive about going public cloud and decommissioning a lot of private cloud. And I don't know if that 
if people here kind of know who they are, but they're they're um, they've provided they've actually done um, some of these these mappings and have been a little bit ahead of us, and so we're 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 vetting it and we're we're trying to make sure that that what they've done in terms of trying to relate uh, the, the the U.S. federal government, the FedRAMP requirements, and and how do you sort of relate that to the um, to state governments? That's that's sort of the work that we're doing with that. Um, and, then, and then there's another uh, state government that we're working with in um, some actually some other areas that are more tangential related to um, IoT and what are some good policies for for like how you do smart cities and and think about some of these next generation devices and how do you come up with good policies on um, how, how you manage those how you regulate those how they would uh, integrate with with cloud environments so kind of an interesting um, area that we're looking at with with them and then a, a lot of states are just sort of you know, they're sort of watching what we do they get occasionally involved in conferences and uh, on an individual basis, there's several individuals that are involved in different working groups, encryption, or forensics, or other areas like that. Sounds like there's just a huge opportunity for uh, le leveraging CSA as a resource that's, uh, that states are just beginning to kind of take advantage of. Uh, are, one one question about mapping: Are you are you do you have anything in planning stages, or are you mapping to ISO 27,018? Uh, yeah, both both 17 and 18, we've got we've completed the mappings. They're going through some quality assurance, and we are we I expect we'll be releasing those uh, very soon, probably within the next uh, month or so. So 20 27,017 is something we we've been involved with from the very beginning, and that's that's the the cloud security. Uh, control or the cloud security standard from ISO SC27 and uh, 27,018 is the privacy, um, the, the cloud privacy standard. And so those those mappings will be out very shortly. And, you know, we, we think that in terms of the, the sort of the, what you call the traditional de jure standards development organizations, our relationship with them is that we're sort of a more agile, more frequently updated standards incubator, and we'll give our research to standards organizations or align ourselves. But at the at the end of the day, the the way that the standards organizations tend to work, like FC27, if you look at 27001 historically, that went eight years between updates, and we think cloud is moving so quickly that there's going to be real challenges for us to sort of just rely on on ISO standards by themselves, to rely on 27,017 or 18 by themselves, they're going to need to have this sort of uh, relationship with different types of organizations like ours that are providing a lot of the uh, relevant updates on a, on a more frequent basis. And so in addition to 27,018, we have a project called Privacy Level Agreement, which we've Developed primarily out of Europe, but uh, so GDPR is it's going to affect all of us, and so it's important to understand this. So this is our 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 roadmap on GDPR compliance, and we work really closely with the. If this gets into some some European specific stuff, but with the Article 29 working group of all the different countries' data protection authorities to make sure that uh, um, that you know, what they're doing is, is fairly uniform and it relates back and is, is usable by industry. So um, the, the, it's, it's a good question, and, and, and yeah, you'll be able to see specifically how this relates to 27,018 very shortly within the next month or two. But go check out Privacy Level Agreement as well on our website. I think you'll find that to be pretty relevant. Very good. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Europe. Um, you've got a, certainly a worldwide view, the Cloud Security Alliance does. Um, where, how would you assess where uh, we're at in North America versus cloud adoption uh, versus, say, Europe? I know you you do a lot of work over there. Yeah, so the, the government adoption. Yeah, the the um, it started first in in the U.S. and because of these sort of traditional views of data sovereignty and 
and the, the larger cloud providers being US-based, that it was easier for US government to adopt it more quickly. And there's been, from when we started, there are a lot of countries that have this, this policy of the information must uh, stay in, in country, and so that ruled out a lot of US cloud providers. So the US went, went quicker. But some things have happened, and, and one is the cloud providers have been building a lot of data centers and with their, uh, their technology figuring out how to create availability zones that keep information within a region, if not specifically a country, although sometimes they can do it within a specific country. And so that's, that's caused a lot of areas like Europe. And, and I, I tell you, I was, I was uh, amazed. I was in a, um, a Santiago, Chile, a uh, hotel lobby, and some people came up to me, recognized me, and it was one of the major cloud providers. I won't say which, but they were like five people there that knew me, such a small world, because they were just signing a deal for the, the Chilean government ministries to adopt this U.S. cloud provider. And so we've seen a big wave I, I, in, in the U.K., one of the largest banks who was very – when I was there three years ago, they were very um, skeptical, and they said, we're all in now, and the, um, the Bank of England basically had said, we, we would like for you to not limit it to one of the major infrastructure providers. You know, please use two for this redundancy, but yeah, we're okay with it. And so we're, we're seeing a big wave of adoption, but certainly it started in the U.S., um, Europe's been next, Latin America, APAC, they're, they're a little bit slower, um, but they're also looking at using, you know, Chinese-based cloud providers as well. So you mentioned the, the, the kind of the proprietary bias for in-country data centers, and certainly that's, uh, that's a big issue, and we built it into, I know, in the, in the uh, Utah uh, contracts, we built in uh, in-country uh, data requirements. Uh, which is fairly common, but I'm wondering, are, are those requirements to keep state confidential data within the U.S., do you think they're reasonable? And just is, is that requirement something that uh, that needs to be updated or addressed in a different way? What What's the future hold there? Well, the future of that is that we're moving more to software-based controls and the ability to create a virtual uh, a virtual country inside of an international data center through the right type of strong encryption and key management. And, and the future is that it's not where the information physically is, it's who has access to it and what are the governing laws that apply. And I think from a, from a, a standards basis, from a, uh, from a technology coming together, that's an example where the technology is gonna make some of the policy moot, uh, or at least e expressed on more of a virtual scale. But that's gonna take a few years and you, I would I would point to something like so Microsoft and very strict data sovereignty rules in Germany, and so they've worked with uh, T Systems, their systems integrator there, and and done some tweaks to Azure so that T Systems is, was a data trustee um, as a German um, company and providing some of the systems administrator capabilities. So you're you're going to see in the the next five years sort of this practical, uh, uh, pragmatic, I guess, view of we'll, we'll, we'll put data centers where we can to satisfy this kind of what I'd say an old school view of physical borders, while at the same time in the long run looking at how we can e express this and get this, get more on board with a software-based view because really you're not more secure and, and, and there's actually some risks and, and I would point to the the, the, the Fukushima incident in Japan, there was a lot of case studies where the, the people who are using international clouds, they're, it, it saved lives and it saved um, a lot of information and a, a, a lot of businesses by the fact that they had that um, geo redundancy and they had it, had it secured. So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the trend line, but I, I think you're, you're going to still see a, a lot of regulators try to dig their heels in on keep it in country where we can for the for the next five years. After that, it's going to go away. So um, I want to go back to something you mentioned uh, a little while ago about IoT, uh, Internet of Things. 
uh, I, I presume you're working on uh, a, a, an IoT uh, maturity matrix or an IoT uh, control matrix. Uh, am I am I right with that? Or uh, yeah, we're 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 working on the same the the similar uh, thing that we have with the cloud controlled matrix and and looking at how we adapt this and so. It's it's a challenge because IoT is such a broad concept, and there's implementations that range from multi-million dollar uh, generators and uh, and centrifuges down to you know uh, sub penny types of uh, micro transmitters that become part of mesh networks. So it's 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 a real challenge to come up with real consistent uh, um, controls framework for that, but we're we're trying to hit some some of that middle of that to be able to have something there. And also, yeah, because a lot of the cloud providers are providing specific cloud services for IoT devices that we're, we're looking to extend all of this to that area. So we have a pretty healthy and robust IoT-based uh, research, and, and we've taken it a lot of different uh, ways and looked at specific industries and, and specific technologies. So yeah, there's a lot happening there. So uh, let me shift to kind of another perspective. I, I think in any government organization, uh, they're, they're kind of scratching their head uh, trying to figure out which applications make sense to move into the cloud uh, from uh, an on-premise uh, kind of uh, approach that they've had, uh, some further along than others. Uh, you, you mentioned the importance of identity and access management and, and, and at least understanding and having a strategy for how, how you're going to do that as, as you move into the cloud. But can you spend a little bit of time giving us advice about what other kinds of things, maybe at a, sort of a general level, that a, that a state or a local government or a province, uh, provincial government, ought to be uh, looking at uh, before they begin to uh, move applications into the cloud? Yeah, well, I think you absolutely got to look at the uh, what what types of data and, and what are any specific um, governing rules about the type of, of data that uh, a specific application might be using with. Is it, is it citizen data that is in? Is it personally identifiable? All those um, sorts of things. To understand, you know, hey, what's what's appropriate to um, do there. Now, it's, I, I still maintain it's it's it that doesn't um, create a um, sort of decision point on do I put that in the cloud or not. But it more gears yourself towards what types of clouds and and security controls do I put around that. But you know, I think it starts with um, the the data itself. Are you are you building your own application to put in the cloud uh, to to manage this and and what's your risk appetite with that or is there a suitable application that's out there once you're sort of kind of in that sort of range then I think it does become you know pretty much a a risk assessment process where you really sort of understand practically do I have the capabilities to do I I mean for anything that becomes somewhat sensitive. I, table stakes are, I've got to have, um, it's got to be um, strong authentication, two-factor authentication. I've got to be able to federate like uh, with my identity system, like a SAML v2 sort of thing. I've got to have full audit logging capabilities that uh, allow it to um, integrate into my security operations center. I've got to have the appropriate SLAs. I've got to have multiple availability zones sorts of things. but. Um, you know, you can you can add all those different areas, and you can you can start to see how you can build a very robust, secure environment. But um, you know, you you look at you can look at the low hanging fruit and say, you know, what are what are things that aren't sensitive that I can do quicker um, um, sort of vetting and move and learn from that. Um, I um, again, how how can I do this with a strong sort of identity infrastructure that helps you um, sort of create a standard way to move different applications out to different clouds. And I think it's uh, I think it's a good idea to make an investment into some type of an intermediary cloud monitoring type of solution like a cloud
cloud access security broker or secure web gateway that gives you very granular information on who is using what out in the cloud so that you can sort of you can, you can see where the demands are and you can um, use that to kind of be useful input into a, a broader strategy on you know here's here's where the demand seems to be so let's go um, investigate that and let's let's move different um, applications in that area so those are just a few different ideas yeah that's uh, that's great advice Jim I, I want to go back to uh, the cloud control matrix uh, are, are, as as um, as states um, execute agreements with uh, cl cloud um, service providers, uh, they'll wind up with uh, service level agreements that uh, define the level of service. So it's, it occurred to me as you were going through the, uh, the cloud controls matrix if that, that there probably are some key controls that actually wind up uh, at least being calibrated in that service level agreement, if not referenced. Uh, is that a, a fair assessment? And are there any that uh, we, we might want to specifically make sure that we consider uh, in a service level agreement? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's it gets referred to in some some in some cases it gets uh, uh, referred to. Um, specifically in a service level agreement as an appendices that you know this um, needs to this this needs to get um, filled out in some way or another that um, the you know the um, all, all, almost all of the controls need to be um, addressed in one way or another if this has um, you know, I would what I would call a medium level of um, sensitivity uh, risk requirements if it's if it's medium, but um, they may not need to be um, you know very extensively addressed. It's it's I get in a little bit of trouble if I just pick like <laughs> ten and yeah. say hey yeah. let's use these or those. But we definitely we definitely have people really focus on the um, the data um, domain, the application security domain, the identity domain, the encryption domain, um, the business continuity um, domain, um, as as being ones that are you know really important from understanding the um, you know the the technical capabilities there, and then always like the governance domain, it's pretty important. But that's a lot of that is also you know what you're doing internally. So, um, but you know data and data and identity um, and and you know the resilience end up being like just key areas to focus on. Okay, very good. I've got this one last question that came in. Uh, do you have a, a an opinion on cloud deployment models? Uh, Rather than going 100% private or 100% public, uh, you know, is is the is the, the optimal approach a hybrid deployment model? Would you agree with that? I, I think that it's the pragmatic way to go for uh, large organizations that have already made a lot of investments and they they need to take a measured approach to how they move to cloud. I think if a, a hybrid uh, uh, ability to you know use use private clouds but have the ability to move workloads into public cloud and to be um, having an architecture maybe it's using containerization or something like that that doesn't lock you into the um, private cloud I'm I'm just personally very bullish when I when I look at like the really smart leading edge um, companies that I talk to they're moving to virtual private clouds inside of public clouds and really looking at that is it's really a software um, construct. And so um, I think that if you if you look at a private cloud only sort of deployment, you you end you're gonna probably end up failing because you're not gonna be able to avail yourselves of a lot of the um, leading edge development tools that are only available in public clouds. 
So, uh, but a hybrid sort of can give you the best of both worlds where you can do some integration, you can sort of take a measured pace from a risk assessment perspective, but also take advantage of, you know, those, the state-of-the-art tools that are available. And we've even some, seen some people who've developed an application in a private cloud, but they liked, for example, the logging function that a public cloud had, that they just would route some of the traffic to a public cloud just so they could take advantage of some of that and do some data analytics in a public cloud. So um, hybrid to me makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, but there are definitely a lot of different ways to do hybrid. Very good. Well, Jim, we're out of time. I, I want to thank you so much. If we can get to the last slide, uh, it, if there are other questions about contracts or uh, if we could move the last slide in, please. Yeah, there we go. If there are other questions about contracts uh, related to these, uh, give uh, Julian an email or send me an email. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for hanging in there with this webinar. Great information, Jim. Everybody have a good day, and we hope to uh, to see you again in another webinar. Thanks, everyone.